those Bibles up, wave them around, make Jesus glad, the devil mad. That's what we do around here. Live stream, y'all do the same. Let's say this together as a heavenly father. I thank you for the blood of Jesus. It did what nothing else could do. It rewrote my history, took away all my guilt, my shame. There is therefore now no condemnation. I come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain revelation today that will change my life, that will help me to create in my life the reality of the Word of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's look at Hebrews 11, please. You can be seated. And uh, Hebrews chapter 11. And I'm going to continue with my series of messages that I'm doing on building your world with words. That's exactly how this world was created to begin with. And uh, we're going to start here in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen or not seen as yet. For by it, that is by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God so that things which uh, are seen are not made of things which do appear. I like the Barclay translation of verse 3. It is by faith that we understand that the universe was constructed by the Word of God, for the seen had to take its origin from the unseen. The seen had to take its origin from the unseen. And then, of course, the Amplified Bible in verse 3, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed, fashioned, put in order and equipped for their intended purpose by the Word of God. Isn't that great? And so therefore, we uh, ourselves can use God's Word and our words to construct and to build our world. When I say world, I'm not about the world out there. I'm talking about your place of domain, your dominion, your kingdom. Jesus is the king of kings. We're the kings he's the king of. He's the Lord of lords. We're the lords he's lord of, and every king and every lord has a domain, has a world, if you will. I'm not talking about the world. We can't change the world. The world is going to hell in a handbasket. We can get a harvest out of it, though. I said we can get a harvest out of it. But in, I'm talking about when I say your world, I'm talking about your place of dominion, your house, your body, your, your, your life, Amen. your marriage, your home, your children, yeah. your career, your business. Yeah. Amen. Your finances. Yeah. You can build your world with your words. Amen. Amen. So, uh, and we talked about last week that in the Genesis, Genesis account of creation, it says over and over that God said and God saw. God said and God saw. God said and God saw. Let's say that out loud. God said and God saw. See, so, so sound comes bef before uh, sight. If you want to see something, you're going to have to say it first. It's, you can't, you, you know, it doesn't do any good to, to talk about what you see because it's what you want to change, isn't it? Typically. So we've got, we've got, you know, God didn't come down here and say, man, it's dark down here. Wow. He said, light be. God said, light be, and God saw that it was good. See, that's how our world has changed, by, by, by sound and then by sight. And so, and we talked about, you know, the fact that if you ever want to see it, you've got to say it and mix faith with it. I mean, you've got to believe it in your heart. Mark eleven twenty three. 23. If Jesus is the one that said it. I'm, not, I'm just giving you what he said. He said in Mark eleven twenty three. 23. So we examine that. Uh, Whosoever shall believe or, or shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things which he saith shall come to pass. He'll have so whatsoever he saith. So we see, you know, the Holy Ghost put in Brother Hagin's heart one time. Have you ever noticed in Mark eleven twenty three 23, it says believe one time, but it says say or some version of say three times. 
And so, you know, no, I never did see that, Lord. No telling how many hundred times he'd read it up at that point in his life, in his ministry. He'd pastored 12 years. Now he's on the field ministry. He had read that verse over and over, preached out of that verse, and never noticed what the Holy Ghost pointed out to him in a time of prayer. You know, that's why we have to be people of prayer. God can point out some things that we need to know if we're praying. So uh, his ministry was birthed in that moment. I mean, go teach my people faith. My people are not missing it based on what they're believing. They're believing generally right, but they're missing it on what they're saying. And you're going to have to teach them three times as much about saying as believing. And so that's why I keep preaching this message. I've preached it over and over since this church started. I'm going to keep preaching it until everybody's doing it. Until everybody's world has changed and transformed into what they want it to be. Amen. So whosoever shall have whatsoever. And then we discovered last time that there's these, the, the word say, uh, the first time it's used is the Greek word epo. It means to say or command. And then the second time, shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those, those things which he saith shall come to pass. That word saith is the Greek word lego, which means to have a systematic discourse. In other words, you're going to have to say it more than once. You're going to have to say it and keep on saying it. This is, if there's anything that I believe that we fall short on, is that middle say, it's the systematic discourse. We tend to say it the first time, maybe the second time, but then, you know, we'll say something else the third time. We'll revert back to call him, you know, the, the problem. We'll talk about the problem. We'll talk about the circumstance instead of what we're believing to change. Are you with me now? Everybody say systematic discourse. And we have all kinds of, of, of evidences of this. Uh, I think about the woman with the issue of blood when she heard of Jesus. She came in the press behind for she said, she had a systematic discourse. She kept on saying, Amplified says. See, she didn't just say it one time. She, she said it every step of the way between her house and where Jesus was. She didn't know exactly where he was. She had to go find him. She had to go down the road. Here she was hemorrhaging, bleeding. Her circumstances weren't any better. In fact, it probably grew worse. She probably was feeling pretty bad by the time she got there physically. I mean, she'd been suffering all those years, 19 years, something like that. No, 12 years. You know, bleeding for 12 years, hemorrhaging. They had no blood transfusions back then. They didn't know how to. She'd spent all her money on doctors. Grew, uh, was nothing better. Rather grew worse. But she kept on saying, "See, nobody taught her things. Nobody taught her faith. She just she did this as our example. I mean, she got what, when she got to Jesus. I'm telling you, that power leaped out of him." out of the hem of his garment into her, and she was healed of that plague instantly. Everybody say systematic discourse. So we looked at Mark chapter 4, the sower soweth the word, and Jesus talked about four cases where you had three of them had a crop failure, and one, only one of them got a harvest. Every one of them heard the word. Every one of them sowed the word. In other words, they said it. When we discovered last week the reason they had a crop failure is because they could, didn't keep on saying it. See, they, they lacked a systematic discourse. So the first one, you know, the birds of the air stole the word. Well, the devil will steal the word right out of your heart. You just say it one time, you'll forget about it. You're going to have to keep on saying it. And then so, so, so forth and so on, all the way through those th first three crop failures, it was all a failure of the systematic discourse. You know, that's pretty important, isn't it? That's worth coming to church over to hear something that's such a key to your victory is what you're saying. And you, the key to you rebuilding or building. See, you can rebuild. You know, we talked about that last week. I gave you my testimony of, of my building career in, in West, a place called West University Place here in Houston where they, uh, instead of building a new house on a new lot that had never been built on, that's what I'd done before, 15 years Suddenly, I discovered a different way of doing business. I'd buy a house that existed. It was about, say, 50, 60, 70 years old. Little two-bedroom, one-bath, wood-frame house built back in the 20s, maybe, 30s at the latest. And here it was in the 80s. So an old house 
Most of the people living in those houses were old and they'd either died or they were, had moved to nursing homes or whatever and here the house is. is and, and so I would buy the house, tear the house down, scrape the lot clean and build a brand new house on the side of the old house and reclaim the land, repurpose the land. Now instead of a little old one bed, two bedroom, one bath, 1100 square foot house, now it's got a five bedroom, five and a half bath, 5,000 square foot, three story on it. That was my last house I built in, <laughs> in that area. This last one was my crowning achievement that the bank took back. See, it was such a good plan. I had a great plan. It was a wonderful plan, but it wasn't God's plan for me to build that house. So <laughs> it, no amount of prayer could stop. No, no amount of prayer could change it. I mean, the whole, the whole front door was just full of dirt and everything because I would anoint it with oil and have anybody and everybody anoint it with oil every time we went over to see the house. I'd show it off to my friends visiting preachers. Hey, let me show you my house I've got under construction. Hey, let's anoint this house with oil. Let's pray. Let's pray this, get a buyer for this house. Well, it, <laughs> it was so cursed. What's cursed? The absence of blessing. God can't bless your plan. I don't know who this is for, but it's good to pray and find out what God's plan is. All right, so we discovered then that you can rebuild your word. You can reconstruct it. I mean, if you don't like the way it started, I mean, if you don't like your marriage, you know, you can do some words. You can use, speak some words that can just re take out all the debris, take out all the bad stuff and put in some good stuff. Are y'all with me now? So, uh, so we had the stolen word, the scorched word, the strangled word, and the safeguarded word. And uh, only the safeguarded word had a, had a harvest. So, uh, and I gave you three things last week, you know, be a person of your word, be a person of the word, and be a person of prayer. Those three are keys to building your world with words. You've got to be a person of your word, otherwise your faith won't stand. I mean, you, you know you're a liar. You know you don't mean half of what you say. And uh, that translates to your faith in God. It just, it's, just a, it's just like a law. So if you want God to honor his word, you've got to honor your word. Be a person of your word. I mean, if you say it, do it. If you speak it, make it good. Swear to your own hurt and change not. We live in a society that people change their mind and they just go back on their word and it doesn't matter. Well, I know I promised, but I can't do it now. It's just things have changed. Yeah, you changed. You changed. God never changes. See, that's the thing you got to realize. <laughs> We're told to imit be imitators of God as dear children and walk like he walks. Well, then you're going to have to be that way about your word. Amen. And then be a person of the word, of course, the word, which, which is what we preach, the word, word of God. And a person of prayer is where you find out what belongs to you that's not, maybe not specifically talked about in the word. You, your prayer life is where you get specific instructions. You got to have a prayer life. I said, you've got to have a prayer life. And we're living in the last days and just having a little old band-aid prayer life where we go, bless me, bless me, bless me, bless everybody, bless brother and my sister and my father and my mother and my four and no more. No, I mean, it's going to have to be a little better than that. All right. So one of the ways to build your world with words, be a person of the word. I want to focus on that today and amplify a little of that second uh, thing, being a person of the word. And I want to attack it from the idea of your identity. Your identity, because we sang about it this morning. And uh, 130 times in the epistles, it says the phrase, in Christ, in him, in whom, in the Lord, by him, through him, all of those, 130 times. It must be kind of important then as Christians for us to find out and look at ourselves as to who, how, how God looks at us. Because the minute we got born again, we became in Christ. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5, and let's, let's look at these verses. Verses 17 through 21, we'll talk about those today as a and how it relates to building your world with your words. You're going to have to have an identity. I said, you're going to have to have an identity. You had one before you got saved, uh, you know. 
That's not the identity you need. You need the new one. And so it says in verse 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, everybody shout, that's me. How do you know you're in Christ? Well, that's, a, that's, what, that's why we teach you the three baptisms. The minute you get saved, the Holy Ghost baptizes you into the body of Christ and you become one with Him. Amen. It's not an effort on your part. It's not anything you did. It's what He did for you. You need to know that. If you don't know that, you're constantly doubting your salvation. That's why people come up and rededicate 3,500 times. In the Baptist church, they don't know what else to preach, so they preach how to get saved to a whole group of people that already got saved. And then they start wondering, well, I wonder if I'm saved. And they come up and rededicate. I mean, this is the dumbest thing. I mean, it's a definition of insanity. Why don't you teach them something that they can win with? Teach them how to get saved that are already saved. I don't teach people how to get saved. Are you kidding? I do that when I'm having a crusade you know, to a bunch of lost people. But in church, I'm teaching you how to get what belongs to you. I'm going to escort you up the escalator up on the second floor where all of your blessings are. They got all the junk down on the first floor. We got to get up on the second floor. Man, it's stacked up up there. Healing and deliverance and finances. Blessings of every sort. Stacked to the ceiling. All you got to do is just get your grocery basket and just start pulling it out. Boom, boom, boom. Some of you are going to need one of those big old dollies, you know, the four wheel. I have at Sam's Club, Costco. All right. So, so in Christ, in whom? So here it is. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, old things, he is a new creature. Literally a new species of being that never before existed. You never before existed. See, you don't identify with your flesh. Don't look in the mirror and say, that's me. That's not you. Uh, You are looking out through your eyes, but you had never seen you. You are a spirit. No one's seen you yet except the Lord. The Lord looks on the heart or the spirit. He sees your spirit, but nobody else does. Everybody else sees your earth suit. Are you with me now? So you're a new creature, a new species of being that never before existed. Old things are passed away. And behold, my dad used to say, look at here now. Look here now. I mean, that was just what he said. Behold, that's what that means. Look at here now. Everybody say, look at here now. See, pay attention. Amen. All things have become new. You're a new creature. Everything's new. He rewrote your history, man. Why are you looking back? Why are you looking down that rear view? In fact, you need to break the rear view mirror. You have no use for a rear view mirror. Ain't nobody. The only thing overtaking you in your, in your rear view mirror are the blessings. The blessings are overtaking you. Let's look through the windshield. Let's look through the word. This is our windshield. This right here. It even shaped like a windshield. You know, let's, let's rake it back like this. The new ones are like this. The old ones are like this. New ones are like this. <laughs> all right. So, verse 18, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us, past tense, to himself by Jesus Christ. There's that phrase again. You've been reconciled. By Jesus Christ and hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, you can tell others about this reconciliation. People are not going to hell because of the sins that they commit, though there are many. We've got it all backwards. We're, we're condemning people to hell because of the sin in their life. But the only sin that they're going to hell over is the rejection of Jesus Christ. Because he's already paid for that sin. He's already done it. What good news we have. All they've got to do is accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior and turn away. Yes, they do have to turn away from that. Well, I can't do it. Yeah, you you can't do it, but he can help you do it. You've got to be willing to turn. That's repent. I mean, 
Repent just means to, it doesn't mean really even to stop doing it. It means to turn away from it. You take a homosexual that's lived this lifestyle and is immersed in it, and they get saved, you know, they might drift back into that at a time or two. That doesn't mean they're going to hell. It just means they need help. It means that they've got a, you know, same with, a, with an alcoholic. I mean, you know, they get saved somewhere and they give their heart to Jesus and they fall off the wagon and get drunk. Well, that mean they're going to hell? No, it doesn't mean they're going to hell. Why? Because they're new creatures. They just haven't discovered yet how to lay all that aside. Oh, he's the remedy. He, the blood of Jesus is the remedy. They've got to understand it. I had a couple of homosexuals come to the church a few years ago. I knew they were. Came together, two men. I knew they were living together. And uh, I mean, they were hungry for what I was preaching. Preached just like I preached. I didn't preach to them. I just preached what I always preach. And they were hungry for it, buddy. And they'd come down here for prayer. And I went to the Lord about, you know, after the first week or two, I said, well, they've come a couple of times now. What should I do? He said, well, they're hungry. Let, let, them, let, them, let the word of God work. Yeah. Leave them alone, in other words. Yeah. Don't confront them. Don't tell them that they're living in sin. I mean, it's not, really not any different than two uh, heterosexual a, a couple living together. We have a lot of people, live, young people live together now. They don't get married until they live together. Then they get married. And there are a lot of them in church. I don't confront people. I just preach the word and let the word work. I let the word work. I don't beat people upside the head and condemn them. But after about a month, the daughter shows up and starts wagging her finger in my face and warning me. Da, 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 da. I said, well, I haven't confronted them, but that day is coming because they're living in open sin and enough people in the church see it. And I can't allow people that live that lifestyle to just a little leaven leavens a whole land. She got all mad. I said, well, I'm the pastor of this church. I'll make the decisions here. I'm not, you're not, you don't have any standing. You're an enabler. As far as I can tell, you're enabling your father. And if you're really, uh, you really a Christian, you'd be telling him he needs to move out and clean his life up and at least stop doing what he's doing. He might not be able to completely control his desire to be that way. I mean, that takes time sometimes. You've got to get your mind renewed to the Word of God. You've got to have, get, be delivered from that demon power. It's a demon power. Man, if we kicked everybody out of church that had a demon in them, I mean, we wouldn't have a church hardly. <laughs> devil comes to church. We'd like to welcome the devil today, please. He's a masochist. He loves to get beat up on, you know. I don't know who needs this, but anyway, I wasn't even planning on saying any of this. Praise the Lord. I get off on these things. But see, I believe the word. See, oh, we've been reconciled to God. Jesus took it all. Do we have to change? Yes, we need to quit that. We need to stop that. But you know, God just has to work on people. We need to love them while they're changing, while they're moving. Listen, as time goes on, as we go forward and saying, we're going to see a lot of people come in this building and they're going to need a lot of love. They're not going to need to be beat upside the head because they've got a, you know, their skull pierced or whatever. Anyway, I'm waiting to see somebody with a, a spike all the way through their temple. All right. All right. So old things are passed away. All things have become new. And we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, we can tell people, you know, all you need to do is accept Jesus. Well, I don't know if I can give this up. Well, you got to be willing to. That's repentance. You're willing to turn away from your sin, and God will help you live the Christian life. Without his help, you can't live it by yourself. And then it says, verse 21, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. There's that word again, in him. 
So what are we? The righteousness of God. Everybody say, I am the righteousness of God. See, I, I, that's a confession of mine almost every single day, maybe multiple times a day. I'm, I'm telling myself that all the time. That's my identification. I, I'm identified with him. See, all of redemption is based on two words, identification and substitution. Everybody say substitution, substitution. and identification. Jesus was our substitute. We deserve to go to hell. He went there for us as our substitute. He identified with our humanity. He identified with our sin. Who knew no sin? The Lord God, the Father, laid on him the iniquity of us all once and for all. I mean, back at the cross, every sin that had ever been committed was being committed or ever would be committed was laid on him. He, he took it all. And he satisfied the claims of justice once and for all. So that's why I say no one's going to hell. Hitler, if, he's, if Hitler's in hell, he's not there because he killed six million Jews. Right. He's there, if he's there, because he rejected Jesus Christ. Are y'all with me? We need to get this straight. We need to understand this. Why? Because we have all these religious ideas, these theories, and we, we apply them, you know, willy-nilly, you know, as we want to. No, we've got to get straight with the Word of God and let this, be, this Word dwell in us richly. See, sub, everybody say substitution, substitution and identification. So the whole door of redemption turns on these two hinges. And so he was our substitute so we can be his substitute. What do you mean his substitute? Well, he's in heaven. We're on earth. We're his substitute. I'll get to that in a moment. It, it said, verse 20, we're ambassadors for Christ. We're ambassadors. What's an ambassador? It's a representative of another government, of another kingdom. I've been in uh, New Delhi. I went down Embassy Row. Brother Osteen was invited to come to the American Embassy there and meet the Prime Minister of India when we were there back in 1994. I didn't get to go with him, but Joel went with him. And they went, met the Prime Minister there at the Embassy, and he was given a royal, you know, had a proclamation, you know. We had a lot of, of dignitaries at the, at the uh, night meeting there in Nehru Stadium. And uh, they rolled out the red carpet. Here they are, mostly Hindus. And, uh, but they did recognize him and welcomed him and cooperated with the meeting. And all the embassies were down on that row. I mean, all these flags and everything. Every one of those embassies, our American embassies, that's American property. That's American soil right in the middle of New Delhi, India. That's the, that is, belongs to America. That's America. So everywhere you walk on this, on this world is the kingdom of God. And we're in the diplomatic corps. What is a diplomatic corps supposed to do? Well, it's supposed to make uh, diplomatic relations to, with a foreign nation. This world is foreign to us. We're, we're not to condemn it. We're to represent our king. Are y'all with me now? So we're his, he, he was our substitute. We can be his substitute. He identified with our humanity so we can identify with his divinity. We're fully identified with Christ. We walk in his, we walk in his place, in his stead. We have his name. When we say it, he says it. You got to understand your words. When you say it, he says it. Why? Because you're an ambassador. I mean, ambassadors can get messed up when they get over there and start talking, you know, outside of their line of authority, they can get, they can be recalled. They can be called home and rebuked. I've never seen one fired like they should be. Some of them need to be fired flying all these pride flags on American soil. And, and all of their liberal, most of them are liberal, I have to say. Most of our State Department and all of the diplomatic corps of America, they're most of them probably communists. Or at least, you know, extreme left wing. You very, you very seldom find anybody like us. 
which is just a, yet another em emphasis of what has to change in this country. Amen. All right, so identity. Everybody say, I, I'm working on my identity. See, your voice is your address in the spirit. Part of your identity is where you live. I mean, that's what people are, are stealing. Their, uh, their identities are being uh, stolen by Ukrainians and Russians. No, I mean, sorry, sorry. Uh, they brought that word up. But they are. I mean, most of, most of the hacking going on is going Ukrainian hacking. I don't know why we're giving them $100 billion to keep doing that. But they're doing They're stealing us blind. I say us, not me, but the country. You've got these hackers, man. They're, th they're thieves, and, and, and they steal your identity. They need to, when they can find your address and when they can get your, your personal information, they get your phone number, they can start messing around, and finally they can get your, your real, I mean, you know, Social Security number or your driver's license number. You know, even with a driver's license number, they can do a lot of damage, and they can open up a bank account in your name and start charging stuff and buying stuff with your, in, your, in your name, and you get the bill for it, but you didn't get the stuff. The devil wants to mess your identity up. He wants you to walk in your old identity that you had before you got saved. He wants to, he wants to nullify your new identity. In effect, steal it. Are y'all with me now? Your voice is your address. I'm telling you, when you speak... You've got to speak from your identity. You've got to speak from your address. Are y'all getting, are y'all, okay, let me just keep going. I got to connect this for you. I mean, people identify with all the wrong things, really, in my opinion. They identify with movie stars. They identify with rock stars. They identify with. Sports figures, they wear an Altuve jersey and they somehow they identify with Altuve or whoever. I'm just using him because he broke his hand playing for somebody else. That's really fun. The Astros paying him millions of dollars and he goes over and plays for someplace else and breaks his hand. Hits a 96 mile an hour fastball off his finger. Now he can't play for the Astros for a while. Miss spring training so he could go play for it. I don't understand that. See, that, that's, that's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. All right. Or they identify with a tragedy like mothers against drunk driving. You got a child killed with a drunk driver, so you join mad. Parents against murder, murder parents with murdered children. That's terrible tragedy. So they identify with a tragedy. They identify with disease. I, you know, I'm in the I'm in the, you know, foundation for, you know, heart disease or the foundation of diabetes disease, whatever. I mean, they identify with all kinds of things. Let's identify with the finished work of redemption. He was made to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. Let's identify properly. Let's not identify with this world or anything in it. Titus 3, let's, let's look at that real quick. I just love this verse. Titus chapter 3, right after 1 and 2 Timothy is Titus. Verse 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. See, you don't earn, you don't earn your, your salvation. You're supposed to do those works. You're supposed to do really fine works. I used to think as a Catholic that if my good works outweighed my bad works, well, then I'd go to heaven. <laughs> I was dead wrong. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't have that right at all. I didn't know this verse. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. Should we do the good works? Yeah, we ought to do them, but they don't save you. But according to his mercy, he saved us. How? By the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he has shed on us just barely. A couple of drops out of the faucet. Abundantly. He shed this upon us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. There's that word again, through Jesus Christ. Through, through, through. There's another through. That's another important thing. We've been regenerated. You know, think about being, a re being regenerated. 
Just to be regenerated means to be recreated. And so basically what this means, along with 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, are become that present perfect. And this, and this present perfect tense means it's continuous. You're not the same as you were five seconds ago. You've been regenerated since then. You don't even have a past past right now. You don't have one. You've been regenerated already. You're continually regenerated. You're continually made new. You're continually. See, I, I'm, I'm getting younger every moment. I'm to praise God. He reset my clock. Are y'all with me now? I'm talking about your identity. And so let's, re, let's, 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 let's understand that our identity has been established by the blood of Jesus. It rewrote our history. It continues to rewrite your history. And we've got to be more righteousness conscious than sin conscious. Do you, can, do you have to, well, you know, Pastor, it sounds like you just get us to get out of jail free card. Well, yeah, basically that's right. We are. We got to get out of jail free card. Not free to us. It's free to us, but not free to Jesus. Jesus paid the price. He, he, he posted the bail. Well, that just sounds like we could just sin anytime we want to. Well, if you want to sin, then you need to get saved. Because anybody that wants to live like that is not saved. Do you want to sin? Is there, are you trying to find an excuse to sin? Because if that's the case, you need to get saved this morning. But the people I know hate sin, and they, they might slip. They might fall short. They might not walk where they should, and they always know it right then, and they always, if they're wise, they will get that under the blood right then. First John 1, 9, boom, I confess my sin. He is faithful and just to forgive me my sin and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Are you with me now? So, you know, you just there's some things you've got to stay, start saying and say them boldly every day. And you've got to get it down out of your head into your spirit because the things which are seen gain their origin from the things that are unseen so you've got to plant that word down in your spirit by saying it over a systematic discourse i'm the righteousness of god in christ i can do all things through christ who strengtheneth me i'm more than a conqueror through him who loved me i mean i just say these things all the time by the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. Thank God I've been healed of atrial fibrillation. I have no fear of inflammation in my coronary arteries has been healed. There's no blockages anywhere. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. You're my healer. You're my deliverer. Are y'all getting this? See, you can, re, you can just build your world with your words. Now, <clears throat> I, I gave this testimony recently, but I'll just briefly say it again. Uh, in 1994, I was seeking the Lord about that house I was just referring to earlier, the 5,000 square foot three-story house that I'd built in, in West University. And, uh, you know, I, at the time it was a, I had it priced at 695,000. I think it, the last time it went on the market, it was for 2.7 million. But uh, today it's probably closer to 5 million. I mean, that's how much stuff has gone up. <laughs> but back then, nobody wanted to buy it. I mean, it, I mean, everybody sold their houses that were close in size and, and price. And it was sitting there, you know, sitting there. And I had $4,000 a month interest accruing on it, and I couldn't pay it. Called the bank. I said, uh, what are you going to do? So uh, we're not going to take it back. Uh, we'll just let it roll for, for now. So they let it roll, but I just meant that I'm still going to pay it. I mean, 4000 a month on top of the loan. 4000 a month on top of the loan. 4000 a month, three months, $12,000. It just keeps going up and up and up. And uh, that summer, still no prospects. I'm wondering when is the bank going to finally just realize they're going to have to foreclose. And I'm not got, I don't have any cash flow. That, there's no cash flow coming in, so I have no money, so I'm working for another builder. 
And uh, so I went to work for him. His company hired my company to watch some houses. He's a build on your lot builder. So I had to get up five o'clock in the morning. I'd spend time in the word for a little while. And then this particular morning, I was praying about my situation, seeking the Lord about where I'd missed it. You know, sometimes if, if things are plugged up, it's never God, it's you. I knew that much. Didn't waste any time begging God for anything. I knew the word works. I'm out of position. I don't know how. I don't know what. I don't know when. I'm going to find out. I'm seeking him. And uh, so <clears throat> five o'clock in the morning, I'm sleepy. I'm, I'm, I fixed to leave the house and leave spring to go to Humble, Crosby, Mont Bellevue, Alvin, and back to spring. That's my route that particular day, <laughs> about 300 miles. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm headed out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave in a little while, but I wanted to spend some time in prayer. And, and I was just so tired, so sleepy. So, and I prayed in tongues for maybe five or ten minutes, and then I kind of fell silent, and my eyes are closed, and I'm almost nodding off to sleep again sitting in my chair. only thing in the house that's on is the lamp by my chair. And the Holy Ghost said, son, you're a minister of the sanctuary. Well, you know, I came to attention. My hair stood on end. My eyes snapped open. I started flipping through my Bible. It's laying open in my lap. I knew it was in the book of Hebrews. I wasn't sure exactly what chapter. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 2a, the first half of a verse. The Holy Ghost gave me one half of a verse. Son, you're a minister of the sanctuary. My margin says sanctuary means holy things. That's Hebrews 8, 2, talking about Jesus, who was a minister of the holy things and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. And I instantly knew when he said, you are a minister of the holy things, that that's where I had missed it because I was a home builder trying to be a pastor part-time and I was pastoring, and I was a minister of the holy things, and I was doing pastoral work at Lakewood, but I was not the pastor, and I was not doing it the way God wanted me to do it. That was my plan. That's what I had drifted off into, and I had really should have started this church before, instead of building that big old 5,000 square foot house. That was the last time I had a chance maybe to do, uh, to start a church, and I didn't do it. So I knew all that just in an instant of time. See, that's the way a rhema word can illuminate you to where you all of a sudden know everything you didn't know before. Are y'all getting this now? I want you to understand rebuilding your world with words. And my words had to change. I said my words had to change because my world had to change. I'm in the wrong world. I'm doing the wrong thing with my time. I'm doing the wrong thing with my money. <laughs> and so I went in and woke Gladys up. I said, honey, honey, God spoke to me. We're ministers of the holy things. It's time for us to quit doing the unholy things and start, plot, you know, start moving ourselves into the ministry full time. We have to. It's, there's, no more, there's no more delay. And she agreed. And we both knelt down by the side of the bed and we committed ourselves to starting this ministry and asking God to show us what to do, when to do it. And from that moment on in July of 1994, with just a sh short few weeks, God began to add to the words, and, and this church is a result. I said, this church is a result. Amen. Glory to God. Talk about a world changing. Talk about my world changing. And really, your world changed, didn't it? Just look at what was working against me. Just look at the destiny that why the devil was working a hundred percent of the time trying to stop what God wanted to do out here. Well, he didn't stop it. And we're here. Glory to God. All these years later, come on, lift your hands right now. Hallelujah. Building your world with words. You get anything out of this this morning? Hallelujah. Well, let's rejoice this morning. Praise God. Systematic discourse. Man, I mean, I started, I got into the, you know, after that, Brother Osteen had given, given me a word a couple of weeks before when we were in Paris. I told about that story. How would you like to have Pastor Osteen stand at the foot of your bed and preach you a custom-made sermon? 
but that's what I got that morning in Paris, France. And uh, I started down that road in, in Jeremiah. I haven't shared this wor in a wor word in a while. I'm through, but I just want to add on to this little part. Um, he said, John, I got a word for you this morning. And he, and cause that's after I told him when I got back to Houston, I'm going to find out where I missed it. That's all I said. I usually didn't burden him with my troubles, but that it was heavy on me when we made that trip. And, uh, he said, I, I got here in Jeremiah 31. He said, verse 16, thus says the Lord, refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears for your work shall be rewarded, saith the Lord. And then he skipped down and he said, and there is hope in your future. John, you, you, you don't have anything to worry about. You've sown your seed. Your God's going to be faithful to you. And he, he's got a good plan for you. You know, he spoke that over me. Amen. So I took these verses and I used them as my jumping off space when I got home. And then God gave me, you know, Holy Ghost gave me Hebrews 8 too. And, uh, and then later on in Jeremiah, I was reading... Kept on going here. I just stayed in Jeremiah. In verse 30, chapter 33, verse 3, you've all heard this verse. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty, or great and hidden things, which you didn't know. Amen. Great and hidden things. There are hid things hidden for you, not from you. Amen. And then on down, it talks about it. And again, in this place, there's going to be, uh, verse 12, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, again in this place, which is desolate without man and without beast and all the cities thereof shall be a habitation of shepherds causing their flocks to lie down. And I was thinking about this area. I didn't know a regional center back then. I was just doing a local church and I felt in my reading of all of what I had that I was going to start a church in the 1960 era. This is where I'm from. This is where I built houses. This is where I was familiar. This is where I've lived for a lot of years. And, uh, and it says, in the cities of the mountains, in the uh, cities of the vale, the cities of the south, and land of Benjamin, the places about Jerusalem, in the cities of Judah, shall the flocks pass again under the hands of him that telleth them, saith the Lord. The word tell, telleth means to number. So when you're a shepherd, you would count your sheep by stretching out your rod and you would cause the sheep to pass under the rod where you could count them. Jesus said, you know, a shepherd is not going to worry about the 99. He counted them. He, he knew there was 100 sheep, and he counted 99. He went after the what? He went after the one that was missing. How did he know? Because they passed under the rod. See, all that spoke to me about starting a church. Are y'all with me now? Oh, hallelujah. I mean, God, if you'll stay in the Word and be a person of the word and have a systematic discourse, your world will change. Amen.